All right, welcome everybody uh, to the yeah uh, talk today, which we're going to be delving into. Uh, yeah, really uh, interesting uh, topic that is going to have a lot of call to actions for the community. Um, that you know we'll have to get together, collaborate in order to make this a success. So today's talk is metadata operations for end-to-end -end data and machine learning platforms. The objective of this talk is to give an intuition primarily on the challenges uh, that are being faced when it comes to managing machine learning systems at scale and specifically how the uh, metadata within the systems differs uh, in, in, in regards to when it's comp compared to the more traditional uh, data uh, systems. So let's dive uh, straight into it. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Alejandro. I'm engineering director at Seldon Technologies. Uh, we're a uh, company that focuses on deployment and monitoring of machine learning models uh, at scale. And we're the authors of one of the most popular machine learning deployment frameworks in Kubernetes called Seldon Core. Uh, I'm also chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, a uh, research center based in the UK that focuses on developing uh, frameworks for the responsible uh, design operation of machine learning systems. And I'm also a governing council member at large at the ACM. So today, uh, what are we going to be uh, covering? We're going to be giving some intuition on the motivations, why should we care, and challenges of how is it, how is it different uh, to traditional metadata. We're going to talk about some of those differences being the relationships uh, that we're dealing with the entities uh, in the MLOps world. We're going to talk about some ways in which we're uh, looking to tackle these challenges through what we can refer to as the open inference protocol, as well as the open inference schema. Uh, finally, we're going to have a call to action uh, for basically things that we can do as a community to continue driving this forward. So let's dive straight into it. So just to set, set the scene, um, you know, just to picture uh, early, uh, you know, 2010s, how it all started, a handful of, of frameworks in the MLOps ecosystem, in the ML ecosystem, that you could pick and choose uh, to be able to even productionize your machine learning models. How it's going today, uh, you know, there is a uh, ever-growing number of MLOps tools that are appearing every single day that are tackling pretty much very similar challenges across very uh, uh, analogous areas in the MLOps uh, lifecycle and MLOps stack. So one of the things that we're seeing and, you know, one of the, the topics uh, of another session that we had earlier this week in the Kubernetes AI Day was that we're seeing a convergence into what is not like the concept of the canonical stack, but a set of canonical stacks. So an abstraction of, you know, what are the end-to-end -end lifecycle blueprint components in your machine learning uh, uh, frameworks. And based on the particular organizational use cases, there would be a pick and choose the best of breed tools for those different areas. Now, even though we are now, uh, you know, getting a little bit more of an understanding of the shape of, of production machine learning, there is starting to be a convergence around being able to ac accept we're moving into a best of breed set of tools. And we are having a sort of uh, standardized set of components that we are still expecting to be filled out, right? Like we still expect to have data engineering. We still expect to have perhaps even feature store, uh, a, a, a deployment and serving framework. Now that we've identified these different components, what we want to understand is, well, what are the interfaces and expected uh, uh, standardized APIs that we would want uh, to ensure they are enforced and fulfilled to, uh, you know, have a thriving, uh, uh, you know, MLOps operation, right? If you're going to, if you're going to bring in a pick and choose best of breed tools, you, you would want to make sure that those best of breed tools uh, have at the very minimum, a set of interfaces, a set of uh, principles, a set of promises, right? Talking about, you know, principles, things like reliability, robustness, security, but in a more, much more pragmatic level. So, you know, when looking at this from the end to uh, end to end, uh, MLOps uh, lifecycle. You know, this is the ML workflow uh, um, um, ecosystem that is put by the Linux Foundation. You can see a pretty standard overview of the, uh, you know, lifecycle of a machine learning model from the data cleansing, data engineering, data splitting, then the training of the models, the evaluation of the models, and then the deployment of those models with monitoring, logging, uh, fine tuning, and then going back to the, to the, to the beginning of the lifecycle. The key thing here, uh, the intuition, is that with that in mind, we already decided that we're going to have this 
you know, best of breed, pick and choose the best tool for each of these stages. Now, what we want to make sure is that as the resources are handed over across every single part of the stack, you have full lineage, full reproducibility, uh, auditability in order for you to know where did this come from? What do I have out there? How do I go back to find who did what? What is the responsibility and accountability structure across my digital resources as they, as they get handed over across the stack? So those are key questions that have to be you know, asked and considered now that we're living in this situation where we're gonna be bringing this best in breed pick and choose tooling, right? Uh, you know, from, from that perspective, it's important to, to make sure that you choose the best tool for your application, but at the same time, you do need to abide by the baseline standards of best practice at each of these stages and ensure that each of these vendors, suppliers, open source tools have the required mechanisms to ensure those principles are enforced around the, you know, metadata management that we're going to be covering, but then also other principles around, you know, that that we have other talks that you can you know, dive in this, in this conference uh, around reproducibility, uh, uh, you know, operational management, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is equally important because we're moving from what is a centralized homogeneous world into a heterogeneous decentralized world. So, you know, I don't know if you remember, perhaps uh, a couple of years back, uh, you know, the, 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 the hype was all around the concept of data lakes, right? Organizations have to go and purchase data lakes because that's going to solve all their problems. You're going to have all of your data mapped out and everything that is going to be, all of your big data is going to be centralized. You're going to be able to consume it and everybody's going to be super happy and it's going to work. But fast forward to now, <laughs> we've moved into a situation where we realized, okay, well, now that we have this centralized uh, you know, investment, this is becoming the bottleneck. This is becoming a bottleneck both from a technological standpoint, but also from the domain standpoint. We have some teams that have very different requirements, the marketing team, the operational team, the data analytics team, the advanced research team. They all have data requirements. They all have machine learning requirements that are going to uh, necessarily have some consistent uh, reusable you know, uh, uh, trends within their unit. So this is where we are starting to move into the concept of the data mesh, right? Data mesh, the first thing that you think about is an infrastructural data mesh, right? Like a set of tooling that is decentralized. But the interesting thing is that when you look at a lot of the proposals for the data mesh architectures, this is more an organizational structure in how you can think of your, your data products, right? This is how you can actually link the domains in a vertical perspective so that you can actually have the concept of a data product, right? Moving from the concept of just machine learning projects, delivering answers into a reusable set of infrastructure, tables, databases, golden data that, that you can revisit. Now, the interesting thing is that this is actually being explored in the world of data ops, right? And the world of data ops has done a lot of really interesting research around how to tackle this. Now, what we want to do in this talk is to start extrapolating it into the world of MLOps and push towards bridging these two worlds where you have the, the data analytics in one side, you have that sort of like, you know, spark world where you're trying to kind of like get interactive analytics and interactive insights into the, you know, perhaps MLOps world where you have operational uh, deployments of models, real time, semi real time serving, uh, data centric uh, view of your ML systems, et cetera, et cetera. So let's have a look at what are the challenges of metadata management at web scale from the data ops perspective. Uh, there, there was a, a really interesting talk from the Data Hub uh, uh, founders. So this is basically the LinkedIn internal metadata management framework that then was open sourced. They have actually some really interesting insights around what are the challenges of metadata at real web scale. So there are challenges that they raised around, uh, you know, complexity and extensibility. So these are challenges around facing this best of breed tooling, the fact that now you have to deal with heterogeneity of interfaces, heterogeneity of systems, this, you know, push towards democratized data mesh where the power is now being pushed to, towards the domains as opposed to a central data lake team. This integration with multiple SaaS platforms to be able to ingest all of that metadata and have the centralized understanding of what I have 
out there, the integration with open source tools that are already out there that you're trying to bring in into your organization, the questions about you know loosely typed versus strongly typed. You know you want to have flexibility for your users to be able to define rich metadata, but you also want to enforce structure so that you can ask meaningful questions on top of that. Schema evolution: How do you make sure that you have backwards compatibility that doesn't have breaking changes? And then use case extensibility, right, to make sure that there is domain knowledge within that metadata. There's challenges at scale, and not only scale, but also heterogeneity at scale. So these are the data relations, right? Whenever you have like graph relationships, when you're extending to like, you know, millions of vertex vertices and millions of nodes, you can't just have like a single, you know, graph database node, uh, 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 machine node where you're running all of this compute. You have to think about web scale when you're actually performing some of those queries and also the liveness of your data, right? It's like thinking, where should I have my data? It, should it be in, in some you know, relational that is then transferred or then should I pull it for some analytics into my graph? Is that going to be like a centralized, um, you know, golden data set that is going to be consistently available? or is that something that is like, you know, run, you know, and made available once so that the analytics is carried out and then removed, right? Um, there's also bottlenecks when it comes to database, ty database types, right? So if you just adopt transactional databases and you have to have different types of queries, this would be another challenge. And we also see that there's not only, uh, you know, challenges of, of wanting to answer questions in relational or data uh, structures, but also full text search, right? So when it, when it comes to having not just... Um, you know, string-based regex, and you want to have like, you know, even embedding-based search, um, that is the question of, well, you know, how do I then achieve that at scale in an operational manner in my, in my data mesh perspective? And then, of course, reliability. Of course, you know, in, in the Kubernetes conference, we're all aware about system reliability, but when it comes to data reliability, it's a completely different beast. It's a completely different problem, right? Thinking about real-time sync between six systems, but potential disparities as this is carried out at massive scale, zero downtime requirements when actually carrying out migrations and also ensuring that you have the auditability in this in this perspective now thinking about the scale of this challenge you can you can realize now that th that that this is challenging because the metadata itself can be as complex and as large as not just your big data but also as your operational ml systems Right? So you're now just not only dealing with big data and the complexities of that, but you're dealing with big metadata. So let's not coin that phrase. Um, so now actually, you know, talking about the, the, the uh, author of this Data Hub uh, project um, that was talking about the challenges at scale. So this is actually something really interesting because this shows you what is the architecture of their metadata management platform. Right? When you think of a metadata management platform, you're like, well, why don't we just like add a Postgres database or, or a MySQL single server database and just store some of our basic uh, metadata. But here you can see that within their metadata ecosystem, you know, they would have ways of automatically crawling uh, 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 metadata across different servers, across different data. They're able to actually stream it into the different applications. They would have, you know, horizontally scalable jobs that are able to process that data. They would have that relational interface towards their metadata data store. They would have those requirements for that, you know, graph uh, type queries. They would have the requirements for full text search and then also that interactive uh, uh, ways in which people can, can, can consume uh, the, 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 I guess, the metadata of the metadata uh, platform. So, so from that perspective, you can even think to yourself, well, why is this so complex? Uh, why would anyone go into that crazy architecture uh, for just a simple metadata service? The reason is because now we're, we're, we're looking at um, the challenge at web scale. Now, you know, the, the point that I had mentioned about bridging those worlds, there is a lot of, you know, really interesting research that has been done in the data ops world. Uh, this is because big data, big data, has been, you know, alive for a long enough time that people have been asking, well, how do I keep track of all of the tables, the views, the visualizations that are available. You know, how do I perform data discovery? How do I store my, 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 my data schemas? How do I have like a central object blob store with unstructured data and actually have an understanding automatically even of what are the, the, the sh what is the shape of my data across each of these locations? Right, and the data ops world has had some intersection with the ML world. Right, we have seen actually people that are using Spark or people that are using like central data lakes that still run ML jobs uh, in like batch or or map reduce type functionality, and we have seen actually the the initial attempt to starting to trace metadata of machine learning models. 
you know, some really great initiatives like the model card that was published a while back uh, that defines, you know, what are the, the, the expected attributes of a machine learning model, uh, the, the, you know, the, the push towards uh, model artifacts that has been a primary way of dealing with metadata management is through artifact stores. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, they also have been starting to explore how to deal with model versioning, right? Versioning of artifacts, versioning of experiments, the dependencies of the models, what does it need to run, the risks of the use case of the model, you know, what are the explainability constraints, etc. as well as the ownership. It's like who built this model, how does it link to the relevant data set? Now, we're going to start diving into how MLOps adds further complexities, right? How MLOps would be slightly different to the data ops and ML world. So the reason why is because you would have a live systems, right? Like systems that you can query in an operational manner. You would be deploying machine learning systems as you would with microservices. And you would actually have similar challenges that you have in your microservice infrastructure for service discovery questions, your, you know, you know, API, uh, you know, schema uh, uh, questions uh, to answer what do I have out there. So things like ML service discovery, inference data schemas, model data schemas, model artifact schemas, pipelines that are deployed, as well as system ownership around, you know, who gets called at, at night if, if, if the system goes down, et cetera, et cetera. So let's actually now dive into the first point, which is how are entity relationships in the MLOps world different, right? So if we take the anatomy of production ML, um, you know, we actually saw this uh, earlier. So let's think about this as, you know, your training data, your artifact store, your inference data, and then your metadata that we're going to be, you know, delving into later on. So you have the experimentation stage where you have mach uh, you know, machine learning engineers, data scientists performing hyperparameter uh, you know, tuning, training, evaluation to ultimately com convert uh, and, and train artifacts, deployable artifacts from training data, right? You would then have, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines for, you know, whether it's ETL jobs that are consistently converting this, you know, artifacts into deployed services, right? You're deploying machine learning uh, models as either real time or batch uh, inference uh, services that you can, you can consume. From those machine learning services, you may also add uh, advanced monitoring components, things like drift detection, explainability det detectors, et cetera, et cetera. And you would want every single input and output of your data to be also stored in, you know, what would be your inference store, right? For audit trails, for reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what you want to ask the question is, if I was to have thousands of machine learning models deployed, well, the question is, well, after I run my experimentation, after I run my CI/CD, after I have dozens of, you know, data analytics teams productionizing machine learning models, what do I have in my production environment? What do I have in this, in this, you know, highly scalable Kubernetes cloud native ecosystem that I can of course, reuse, right? What are the services that I have replicated? What are the instances where I have like this pre-processing NLP pipeline deployed 40 times across 12 different teams, right? These are the questions that you would want to ask so that then you can ask, well, what value can I extract from what I already have out there? And then even going beyond of like, well, how can then I start mapping problems within my business with things that I already have as capabilities in the production environment? So let's actually dive of what are the limits, uh, you know, specifically the limits of model artifact stores. Why can't we just use an, an artifact store as a, as a production metadata management tool? So let's think about first our data set, right? So let's take, you know, instances for data set A. So here we would have data set instance A1, A2, A3, A4 until AN. Then we would have a set of experiments, right? This is still in our experimentation side where you want, want to train data sets into trained artifacts. So we would first train an initial experiment that gives us a model artifact A1, right? So in this case, we have model A1 that was trained with the initial half of our data. We then have model artifact A2, A3 until AM, right? So each of them trained with different subset of data, with different hyperparameters, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, similarly, we have another model trained with a different data set. So this is what our artifact store stores right? The artifacts that are available for deployment. So now what is the relationship that we have in terms of the challenges in our production environment? Well, the challenge that we have is that when we deploy models, we are creating instantiations of existing artifacts, right? We may have our artifact AM deployed in environment CX, but also in CY, 
right? We have our, 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 the same artifact deployed in two different environments. But also we have another pipeline that is using model M, AM, but also model B1, right? So we have now this very complex one-to-many uh, relationship and many-to-many -many when it comes to pipelines that we now have to think about, not just from the perspective of the deployments, but also the versioning, right? Because what if I change the pipeline to have another model? That's a new version of the pipeline, but still perhaps the same models that I have deployed. So, you know, I don't expect you to kind of like, you know, internalize and grasp all of this by memory, but just, you know, the key thing of this slide is that it's hard, right? It's not, and it's not something that we can just use with, with the existing one-to-one -one relationship that would be enforced with existing model artifact stores. So we have to consider many-to-many -many relationships in production environments. And because of that, we need to have some service discoverability. If you deploy a machine learning model, that will have metadata that is extended to what the artifact would have, because it would have further descriptions. Perhaps the schema that is exposed for the APIs is different. Perhaps the actual parameters that were provided in the environment variables have a, make, the, make the artifact behave differently. Perhaps you have different versions that have to be considered with simple changes in your service. And these actual services would have to be able to, in some way, provide that data so that it's actually discovered, right? So with that, now we can think about, well, how do we then tackle this challenge? And why would we tackle this challenge? You know, the way that we have seen this, you know, at Selden, we have actually had to deal with, uh, you know, organizations and environments that have thousands of machine learning models deployed. So the way that we are able to tackle this is taking our own responsibility as an open source tool. And we're going to say, we're not going to build a completely new feature store and try to sell it as the, as the brand new feature store. We're not going to try to build an, a, a new metadata management system and try to sell it as like the, you know, or not sell it, but like publish it as the, as the new metadata management system to solve all your problems. What we're doing is just trying to ask the question, what are we responsible for in our system? What are the services that are running within our system? What is the metadata that is running within our system? And what are the ways in which external systems can consume that data for service discovery and for higher level enrichment? So in this case, what you can see is that we want to enable ultimately users to enrich by adding metadata to models to discover and find available models and to be able to do lineage and audit for existing models that are deployed, you know, in this case within Seldon Core, uh, but with the question of, uh, and with the assumption that there's going to be an, a centralized external metadata management system that is going to ask the higher level questions across the end-to-end -end ML life cycle. And we would expect that the, that the model artifact systems, that the experimentation training systems will also be able to play nicely and expose those, those, uh, those, those, that information so that we can all work uh, in tandem. Uh, as, a, as a happy community, right? So, so, so that is basically the, the, the call to action in, in regards to the, to the relationships. Now let's dive into another problem. So now we have nailed what are our relationships in, in terms of our MLOps deployment and our machine learning services. Now let's ask the question about data, right? We have now a problem, right? We have the data ops world that is operating at the data analytics side, at the experimentation side, at the, at the training data, let's call it, side, of course, that's not, you know, you know but just, just for the sake of simplicity, at, at, at the training data of, the, of, this, of this slide that I had shown. And then the inference production uh, machine learning services are basically creating data in your inference world, right? So this is unseen data points that may actually have divergence distribu that divergent distributions. It might have like, you know, further considerations. It, it may have like impacts into potential use cases. So you have data that is being also created in this world. Now there's a question of how do we bridge these two worlds, right? How do we make sure that for our, our you know, schema, uh, our, our data in our data lake of schema S1 and then our data in our inference uh, store of schema S2 has some like transformation function that would allow us to convert to and from, right? So that we are able to actually consume that data in a meaningful way. But not only, this is not only important to transfer data from, from, from training, from, from production to, 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 to our central data lake, this is also important now that we're moving from the concept of a model-centric view, from deploying and productionizing machine learning models into this data-centric view, the productionizing of machine learning systems. So this is a question that we need to ask because now the machine learning systems that we deploy are not just a three-step NLP pipeline that has a pre-processing step, an inference step, and a post 
post-processing step. Now we're deploying complex machine learning systems. So this is actually an interesting uh, paper from 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 uh, Facebook research, uh, meta research that you know shows uh, what their you know search uh, uh, infrastructure looks like. You know you can see that there is some offline uh, document embedding indexing uh, job that happens uh, you know on the side, and then there is kind of like you know different stages of the query processing, the retrieval, uh, and the ranking for the for the actual inference uh, stage. And at this stage, you know, you may have some like NLP preprocessor um, component somewhere deep inside of here. You, you, don't, you, you do not want to be in a situation where you would have this component replicated a hundred times across your hundred teams just because you're not aware of what is currently in your production environment because this leads into unstandardized uh, heterogeneous risks. Right. So for that, we have to ask the question of, well, now that we have this data centric machine learning system paradigm, what are the problems that we're facing? OK, well, let's dive into some of those problems. The first problem is inference data heterogeneity. Right. Back, you know, a couple of years back, uh, each of the machine learning deployment and serving frameworks had a different interface, had a different signature. So us at Seldon Core had the Seldon protocol. Right. It looked like an, an array within the array. KServe uh, also had a different uh, protocol, had something that looked kind of like TF Serving, but also a little bit different. TF Serving had a different protocol. MLflow had a different protocol. PyTorch just allowed you to send binaries. So, you know, it had, you know, another protocol. So you had a situation where you had different ML services that are running, but you have stuff flying around in ways that are completely unstandardized. So the first step is to tackle that problem. Unfortunately, you know, we already have a solution to that problem, which is already in production and adopted by several players in the market. So this is actually called the V2 protocol. Uh, so it's a collaboration between NVIDIA, Selden, the Triton, uh, 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 K, the case serving team to start to come, come into an alignment of what is a standardized protocol that we can adopt so that everything that is flying around in your machine learning systems is actually standardized. Um, so, you know, for, for, for this, you know, we can see it as the open inference protocol. This is a standardized schema that allows you to have a REST and gRPC interaction between your machine learning services. And this is great, right? Because not only we've been able to come up with a standardized signature, but we have been able to also provide a minimum level of features and functionalities for anyone that claims to have a serving capability. We, we, we have kind of like the standard uh, interfaces for multi-model serving by design, multi-version support for machine learning models that are deployed, model management APIs, model metadata APIs, and server slash model health APIs, right? So this is actually basically not only aligning on standards, but coming into an alignment of what do we feel are the baseline best practices or how to avoid bad practice at the very minimum in order for anyone that is deploying machine learning servers into production. So that is the first step, right? Like, so now that we have standardized APIs, standardized interfaces, so now we can look at the holistic end-to-end -end life cycle of the machine learning uh, pipelines and start asking the questions of, well, now that you have deployed machine learning services, now that you have experimentations that are running uh, evaluation at scale, now that you have like data labeling services that also require the data schema to be able to function properly, how do we start thinking about mapping all of these different stages to start getting and empowering the business units to collaborate without having to without without the need of a centralized uh, 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 a centralized thinking? So the question now is how do we then map this 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 deployment side with your data lake data labeling uh, earlier st stages of the equation? And the way to think about it is well. Now that we have a standardized protocol, we can start asking meaningful questions of what does this ML service actually do, right? And we can think about an ML service as a component that has a set of meaningful inputs and meaningful outputs. It is, in a way, you can think about as a database query, right? You can have a machine learning model that is deployed, and if you have a specific data, uh, a specific data set, you can actually run a query by transforming that data set by running it through that specific model. So you can ask the question of, okay, well, I have this machine learning service with this shape, with this expected signature. 
And now we have to extrapolate into what we refer to as pipelines or machine learning systems. We have the concept of a simple pipeline, right? You have an input that then is passed into another model, and then you have the actual output. So the, 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 the actual interface of this pipeline is the input of the model one and the output of the model two. Similarly, you can have combiners where you have the input into two models, and then you have to, the output from a, from a combined uh, 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 aggregation of these two models. But then you can also have machine learning systems, right? Where you have real world scenarios where you want to ask the question of what is my inputs, what are my outputs, and more importantly asking the questions of how is my inference being affected downstream and up the stream. So that, those are the type of questions that we would want to ask. So again, we have good news for this, that we have now standardized a protocol for the extension of this open inference protocol into an open inference schema. So this is another sort of like proposed and you know, adopted approach into what is the shape of the model inputs and the shape of the pipeline inputs and outputs. So once you have this, this, this understanding and you know what the shapes of your machine learning systems are, you can start thinking of the, of the data-centric view of your machine learning systems in, 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 in the perspective of what, I, what is the value that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm receiving from the services that I have deployed, and more importantly, how do I then map this actual, um, this actual value that I'm, that I'm, that I'm pro providing into the business outcomes that I require across my you know, horizontal, horizontally growing uh, uh, you know, business units, right? So th those are the type of questions that you can ask. And the way that this looks like is basically uh, you know, as simple as being able to define and explain what is, what is the shape of those you know, inputs, is it a categorical uh, probability, a tensor. And again, you know, this, is, this is very important, not just to come and say, hey, look, you know, we've, we've solved it, right? Because we're far from solving this problem. What we want to do is to have this final call to action and you know, really kind of push and, and, and request practitioners, not just in the inference side, but at every single stage of the MLOps lifecycle and the data ops lifecycle to collaborate, to come up with, with, with what could be standards that, that we can all align into and be able to, to, to contribute uh, so that we are able to, to you know, uh, I guess, achieve this, this, this uh, capability for end-to-end -end, uh, uh, interoperability at scale. And um, you know, collaborate further uh, into you know defining this and solidifying this, uh, so that it can become a proper you know even to a certain extent a proper standard, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the sense of like the ISOs and the IEEEs. Uh, and the reason why is because in several cases, and this is a quote to remember, uh, bad standards can be uh, 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 better, <laughs> can be worse <laughs> than no standards. So yeah, we don't want uh, bad standards. We want. Uh, uh, yeah, but bad standards better than no standards, right? And it's something that, like, at scale, you have to, like, uh, you know, consider because when you have no standards, you just have, like, stuff flying around, right? Like, you don't know what is the potential value that you could consume. So, you know, I'm not saying, like, we need bad standards, so we shouldn't aim for bad standards. Uh, we should aim for good standards, but uh, at, the, at the end, it's, like, at least having something that is standardized. Um, and, of course, you know, making sure that, that, that we're not just creating a standard to uh, 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 rule all of the other standards, right? Because otherwise, we're going to end up in, like, a, a recursive loop that is never going to end. So, yeah, so with that, uh, I'll leave that in, the, in that call to action. Uh, so thank you very, very much uh, uh, for, for everybody for joining this session on metadata operations for end-to-end -end data and machine learning platforms. Thank you very much. Awesome. So I think we have, I guess, two minutes. Two minutes for questions? Awesome. Yeah, so we have two minutes for questions. Yeah, I'll repeat the question if you, if you shout it. Pipeline part. Have you done the same analysis for the the workflow uh, part of the of the whole system rather than just the serving part? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the answer is is no. Um, so so you know I can't I can't stand here and you know um, claim that I would understand and ha and become sort of like fully knowledgeable in the other stages. So one of the main reasons for this talk is more for that call to action uh, to kind of encourage. Uh, the other areas of the ML life cycle to push towards uh, coming up with those tough questions. 
what is the metadata that I am accountable for providing and that is able to be consumed by those higher level systems. What I can say, however, is that there is a lot of really interesting and applicable content in the earlier stages of the ML life cycle, in the experimentation side, in the data analytics side. However, um, that actually falls short when it comes to integrating into that final stage of, well, not final, but into that latter stage of machine learning deployment and serving. So, so yeah, so I mean, what I would be interested about is to collaborate with people that are uh, interested in the earlier stages of the MLOps lifecycle. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, another question. Okay, so yeah, so the question is, uh, there is a broad range of uh, machine learning algorithms that are continuously growing in number. Um, how do we uh, deal with that complexity in the context of, of standardization and metadata? No, that's, that's, that's a great question. So the way that we, um, the hypothesis that we have, right, is basically that um, in the data science, data analytics, um, uh, I guess, part of the machine learning life cycle, um, the convergence is towards heterogeneity, right? M relevant tools for relevant use cases. Some may be using Spark, some may be using other tools, right? And different algorithms, right? But what we're now looking uh, into, into the convergence on, on, the, on the later st stages of the machine learning lifecycle is then standardization of interfaces, metrics and operational considerations so you can have whatever like in the microservice world you you as, a, as an ops person you don't ask tell me exactly what is the lines of codes on in your django app right you just ask the question of what are your what are your what are your uh you know uh service uh interfaces what are the metrics that you expose and what are the slos slis and slas that you want to establish in order for us ops people to be able to like look after your services and make sure you avoid leakage of abstraction. So one, like some of the things that we're focusing on is creating tools like, you know, ML server for machine learning serving, uh, Seldon core for orchestration in Kubernetes to, to, to come up with standardized uh, 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 layers that allow you to just abstract the data science uh, uh, separate to the operations. So I would say that we are going to most likely be looking at heterogeneous algorithms, heterogeneous tools, but with the, with the push towards abstracting them from the ops. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I think we've wrapped up, but it's uh, time for the break. So happy to uh, take any questions. Yeah, informally. Thank you so much. Thank you. All.